All right, folks, welcome to a talk on Autorest, the module generator. I couldn't come up with a cooler name than that, so I'm glad you guys still showed up. I go by the Posh Wolf online, bless you. Um, all my sessions are in my repository, so you don't know where, if you want to take pictures, you know, feel free to, but don't feel like you have to. I got all, all the links, these slides, all the code we'll be looking at today. Uh, it's in the Posh Wolf slash sessions. Uh, so, oh. See, I updated my other slides so I didn't have to do this. Um, so I'm, I'm Anthony, that's my real name. Um, I'm from Eugene, Oregon, so I like to bike, eat granola, grow my beard. Um, yeah, you're from Eugene as well, yeah. Um, so I also figured out the hard way that you can get pulled over on a bicycle. Uh -huh. Ran a stop sign, got pulled over. Um, but I got a wife, two dogs, three descendants. These are just some fun facts, you know. I've been in IT for a long time, I blog, I tweet some time. Done a pro site course, I'm on tech snips, I do some consulting on the side. But also employed, my boss said, hey, we're paying for you to be there, so wear your runway shirt. So I work at Runway. We're actually sponsoring the summit. Uh, so I got a quick slide on what we do. Uh, oh, this also has all the, sorry, I meant to take this part out because I hate doing the back and forth. Um, so Runway is like an agent-based orchestration platform, uh, which essentially means we can run any code anywhere that the agent exists. It's not restricted to PowerShell. Um, but I like the PowerShell part, that's why I'm involved. Um, we can literally, anything that will execute on an endpoint, Runway can orchestrate and scale and automate on thousands of endpoints. Uh, fully API driven. So the talk today is based on all the work I've done to develop our SDK for our API. An SDK is just a different word for a module. So the people that call it the SDK are the people that have the power, the developer backgrounds. So we all call them modules. So, but for this talk, I'll probably switch back and forth. Um, we support Windows Linux containers. We can move data between endpoints, so no networking required. Um, and we're also heavily invested in PowerShell because I like PowerShell and I work at Runway. Kind of funny how that works. Um, we, have, we do have like a free community version. The signups is broken, so if you want an account and want to give it a try, reach out to me and I'll set you up. Okay, but yes, I'm here. I like PowerShell, so let's get into talking about Autorest. Uh, so before, Dang it, I'm sorry guys. Before we get into power or into Autorest, I want to cover a couple of definitions, make sure we're all on the same page. Autorest itself is a tool built by Microsoft. You literally take an open API spec, which is a YAML or JSON representation of an API, you shove it in Autorest, and Autorest gives you a PowerShell module. It's a little more complicated than that, but that's the high level, and we'll get into actually using it. Um, but Autorest supports the language that I have, languages I have listed here. We, of course, only care about PowerShell. You know, screw the rest of them, who cares? <laughs> uh, an open API, uh, I kind of mentioned this. Uh, it used to be called Swagger, in V2 it's called Swagger. Uh, my company, our, our API generates a V2 <coughs> definitions file, so I'll be saying Swagger a lot, just because that's what we use. Um, but the V3 is open API. I don't know all the differences between V2 and V3, but V3 is well, hopefully better, because it's V3. Um, but we'll be looking at a V2, and a lot, a lot of the concepts will translate from one to the other. Um, and examples. You guys have all heard of Azure, right? AZ modules, those are Autorest modules. <coughs> Graph modules are all Autorest modules. And this is really important uh, because, well, first of all, Microsoft develops Autorest. Microsoft develops these APIs. Microsoft develops these SDKs. What that means, it's a fully supported tool by Microsoft. If you guys run into problems, you want to see how Microsoft does it, these are the modules to look at. And so you notice I didn't list the Runway SDK here. <laughs> That's an example. I have spent too much time looking through like the Graph SDK, because I've used that module a lot, just to see how they do things. They do some really fancy stuff with directives, and we'll get into what directives are. But if you want some really good ideas, those are some good modules to look at. I reference them uh, quite a bit. So what we will be covering today uh, so I'm going to run through what it takes to set up Autorest. We're not going to run through the setup because I didn't want that part of the demo not to work. So I set everything up, tested it beforehand. Uh, but I have all list of everything you need to have installed, how to install it, all the commands and stuff. Um, we're going to cover th what a, an open API file is and take a look at it. So I have taken the uh, Runway open API file or Swagger file, because it is v2, uh, and just kind of uh, taken out a lot of it. So we'll focus on just the basics, what it does. Uh, we'll build the module, we'll add authentication to the module, because by default, uh, it's 
I don't know if it's hard to, but it, the authentication is not expressed in the open API spec. So if you, you so uh, you know when you do an OAuth, you get a token and then you have to pass the token as a bearer token. You have to do that part manually. That's the hardest part. That was a big hurdle for me. So we're gonna, we're gonna talk about how you can do that. Uh, and then we'll look at adding custom commandlets. And I have a really good use cases in our API for why we did that. And then I mentioned directives. So the model is ma the module is automatically generated and you don't always want the out of the box stuff that's generated. We'll look at how to customize that. And you can get really powerful with directives and we'll talk more about that when we get there. So, prerequisites. This is probably redundant because we're gonna talk about this in a second. <laughs> These are the prerequisites. Gotta be PowerShell 6 at least. You have to have that to use it even though um, the SDKs will work in v5.1. Um, but the rest of these, Node.js, .NET, SDK2, AutoRest, and AutoRest PowerShell, we'll cover how to install those. Uh, and so my demo environment here, I've got Windows 10, um, all the pre previously mentioned prerequisites, VS Code, and PowerShell 7.2.2. Parentheses, it should work in Windows PowerShell. I'm referring to the SDKs. It's probably really confusing, and I'm sorry. I'll take that out before I post this. Um, you have to have PowerShell 6 to be able to do this stuff. Yes, and I'm gonna repeat that because I'm, re I'm remembering to do that today. When you build it, you need at least PowerShell 6, but it will work in v5.1. What you do build will work in v5.1. So, okay, so, and everything we're looking at today is gonna be in, in GitHub. Uh, sorry, this is what, uh, what I had to set up earlier. Okay, so prerequisites. Here, I'm gonna be fancy and use the pointer. Okay, so, node, is this big enough for you guys? Big enough in the back, should I zoom it in? Okay, uh, so Node.js, uh, so Microsoft says 12.19, I've got 14 something rather installed, so 12 at least is what they mean. Uh, I, I use NVM, which is, stands for Node Version Manager. You can use this link to install it for Windows. That just means that it will manage multiple versions. Um, but once you do have it installed, uh, you can just use npm to install AutoRest. So it's npm installed SG AutoRest. Same thing for the .NET uh, SDK if you don't already have it. <coughs> AutoRest PowerShell, I've got the link to the GitHub here. Uh, it's installed automatically, so you don't have to worry about that. Uh, and then PowerShell itself, I mean, you guys know how to install PowerShell. I prefer the MSI from the GitHub repository because you, you get the, you know, the Explorer context menus, uh, but you can install it with npm if you're in a hurry. So, and we're not gonna demo that because I didn't want to have to, to um, wrestle with my laptop here. Okay, so a swagger file. And this is gonna get kind of complicated. So what we're gonna do is uh, just hit the basics here. And if you guys got questions as we go, let me know. Uh, I spent a lot of time looking at our swagger files, so I might skip over things, a few things. So first off, um, this X generator, this is just specific to the tool that our dev team uses to build this. Don't worry about it. Uh, Swagger v2, so this is actually Swagger, it's not open API, even though they're the same thing now. Uh, this info is just metadata about it, so runway API uh, v2, so the v2 is our backend v2, even though our developers have called it v2 for months, whatever. Uh, line eight, the host, so this is where it's actually gonna talk to where our API is, uh, and the, in the directives I can get into how you can uh, make this so this is configurable without doing anything to uh, the spec here, and then schemes HTTPS, you know, not HTTP. Uh, and this produces block. Uh, this is something that I add manually, and we'll kind of cover some of the manual stuff at the end. Um, this is just, are you guys familiar with when you're doing, using invoke rest method, you can have the accept header and the content type. So the content type is what you're sending to an API, and the accept is what you expect back. So this is what, this produces block, <laughs> when you're defining an API is telling you what the API produces. So you should always have an accept of application JSON when it, you see it produces for the API. So having this in the root tells the generator that anything it doesn't have a produces block will default to JSON. And we'll look at some of the paths here. Uh, so these paths, so you guys are familiar with how these paths work in an API, like it's just telling it what specific resource that you want it, you're getting, you're posting, here, let's look at, let's expand one of these just a little bit further. 
Uh, so for instance, connections is a resource in our API. So you can get, you can post, you can delete. So imagine that as get, set, remove, right, in PowerShell. Um, and so, let's expand one of these out uh, to see the actual parameters. Uh, oh, there's none. So get, you don't have parameters, right? <laughs> that's, an, that's an impost, let's look at a post. So inside of the post, you have all these settings here, and I should actually also focus on this operation ID. So the operation ID is used by Autorest to determine what verbs to use. So I, w I expected that get, post, delete would be, you know, get, set, uh, remove. Autorest infers a large number of verbs based on the operation ID. So it's actually gonna look at the create section of the operation ID. There's some standardization with how operation IDs work. I don't know what those are, but in ours, we use create for the posts. In this case, so it knows that it's actually creating one. So this will be a new connection. And I got a link to show you what, um, what words in an operation ID map to what verbs in PowerShell. Since you, the code for Autorest is open source, so I got a link for that too. We'll, we'll cover that later. Uh, but you can see the consumes. So this is where you can see what it takes and then what it produces. So this one has a produces block, so it's not gonna use the default produces. That, so the question is, what is the plus JSON? I don't remember. Okay. I asked one of the developers at one time, does anyone here know? Oh, maybe JSON 5? Yeah, I don't, I'm not sure. Okay. Okay, yeah, yeah, maybe it's JSON 5. But, but I don't know, that's a really good question. Uh, we have it in all of our consumes blocks for some reason. <laughs> Just in case, yeah. There might be a reason, I don't know what that is. Uh, okay, so, but if you wanna see the parameters, we can see them spelled out in the parameters block. And so, and so this is really cool. Um, because you can see um, whether or not it can be null, if it's required, and the schema. So the schema itself is actually an object, and we can define that object and use it multiple times by listing it in the, and by we, I mean the developers, uh, by listing it in the definitions block, which is down below, so we'll get into that. Um, and we also see, let me use my pointer here, that we can also see what the name of it is and where it is located. So parameters can be, and I wanna cover this just really quick, uh, to make sure we're all on the same page. Uh, parameters can be in a number of locations. Uh, got some nice uh, mark down here. So when a parameter is in, which one is this? In the body. Uh, it's actually passed as JSON. So, in, so this is just a raw like API call you'd see in Fiddler. Uh, and then so if this was in PowerShell, you have a parameter passed in the body uh, with the body Parameter. So in this case, I'm passing a hash table to convert to JSON because this is sending JSON to an API. Okay, so that's a body parameter. And a query parameter, and this one gets uh, a little weird to look at. This is where you have in the URI, or URL, I forget which is which, uh, where you have you know, email equals, and then you have the next one is separated with an, the ampersand, password equals, remember, remember equals. And so those are query parameters. Okay, and in PowerShell, you just have to come up with a cool way to build out, uh, build out the URI. So I just, I just had this array that's joined with an ampersand, and then I, I appended it to the, to the URI here. Does that make sense? And then the, la the last way you can pass parameters uh, is in the path. So in this, in this example, I, I haven't actually replaced a count ID, uh, but in our, our, our API we use uh, GUIDs, uh, so that would be a, a GUID ID and that would tell it what specific account to get. And we can look at the Swagger example as well. And in PowerShell, you just gotta come up with a way to put that, uh, that parameter into the URI itself, if you were doing this in raw PowerShell. Yes, yeah, good point. So this is a string, it's inside of double quotes. Thank you. Cool. So then in the Swagger itself, oh, it, it re-uncollapsed everything, so let's, sorry, this thing is, this file is huge, so it, 
uh, so it can be a little unwieldy. So line 96 here, um, that should allude to the fact that it takes the parameter, uh, we look here, the parameter is in path. So this is really important so that the, the generator itself knows that when you say uh, get connection dash connection ID, that it will then take the string that you pass in, put it in the URI. So that's how it knows to do that. And then I think I've, I think I might have examples of other things as well. Is there a swagger? There, uh, so there, there is a, ooh, that is, I didn't even think about that. So I, I have a, I found a, I haven't seen anything to help with editing. There might be. That's a really good question is, is there one? But. Oh, uh, okay. What's that called? It's called Stoplight okay, so Stoplight Studio, I'm just, I'm just saying it for the recording. Stoplight Studio is a way to, you can edit YAML ones. Uh, so I have, there's a Swagger preview extension, uh, and this is gonna look really funny unless I close the Swagger and I don't want to do that right now. But it gives you a, like a UI, and this should look familiar if you've seen some of these in API documentations. Uh, let's see, let's close that. Okay, so here's an example of just the parameters in body. So you know this one will, so the generator will know to produce JSON uh, since we have the consumes block. So this consumes JSON or plus JSON, whatever that is, we don't know. So any, any questions around this Swagger doc? There's one thing we forgot to look at, I just remembered. So I'm glad I asked for questions. Uh, so in the responses, this tells you what it sends back. So the parameter can be an object, the response can also be an object. In this case, this one takes uh, definition slash login request. So the nice thing about VS Code is when you're looking at JSON, you can just control click on some of these links and we can look down. So I'm now in the definitions block of the Swagger doc. So you can see definitions here. If I go to login, I think it was response. We can see this is an object and this is gonna return uh, two things, a TTL and a session. So when we authenticate, that's how we get our session token. So, so I want to look at that one. Uh, but this is also how um, Autorest can actually build like all the classes and stuff, and so you can have output and input types into the commandlets. So, okay, any questions about Swagger? Or sorry, Open API? Uh, cool. Let's let's uh, let's go ahead and build one. Build our first one. Uh, so the command is really simple. Auto rest, and then you can pass a markdown file. So there are two ways to do it. You can call auto rest and pass all the, the, um, the parameters via the command line, uh, but if you want this to be reproducible, the easiest way is to put all the parameters inside of a readme file. Uh, so I have that here, and let's close out the terminal. Uh, and these are all the parameters that you would pass uh, well, let me rephrase it. These are all the parameters that I passed to build my module. So let's, let's walk through these really quick. Uh, so up here, line four, I am uh, pinning on a certain version of autorest.powershell. I found a bug in, that only happened with our Swagger for some reason. So they released a bug fix for me. Thank you, autorest. Um, and the input file, so this is the Swagger file itself. So I'm, I'm referencing, so I'm using the you know, relative paths to reference the Swagger doc that we just looked at. Uh, and Autorest was originally developed for Azure mod, the Azure modules. Uh, so they decided that not everybody likes all the extra Azure stuff. So Azure false, unless you're actually building the Azure module, so everyone here is gonna be Azure false. Um, PowerShell, we're building PowerShell, so PowerShell true. Output folder, this is where it's going to output. So in this case, I have this, <coughs> I have this subfolder called source, and I'm gonna dump it all there. Uh, and the clear output folder, uh, whenever, whenever I started, I left this to false so I could you know, edit files or whatever I needed to do until I got all the customizations figured out. Uh, so that's one thing I recommend when you're getting started. 
is you can either not specify clear output folder or just set it to false. In the namespace, so AutoRest, even though it's generating a PowerShell module, it does it all in C Sharp. So it uses uh, namespaces in C Sharp. So no one's gonna see that, uh, except when, if you're, they get into some of your object types. So, so, but, so it's, you know, you can get fancy with it or not. I call mine runway SDK dot PowerShell. And then the module title itself, uh, and the uh, prefix. So instead of get, having a get connection, this is now gonna say get RW connection. So RW for runway. And module version, uh, and metadata. This metadata should all look really familiar, because that's just, you know, stuff you put in PowerShell manifest. Yes? So why, why do I have the, the YAML in, in a markdown file? Yeah, why, yeah, exactly. Okay, so, so the reason is, is that's how AutoRest is designed. And let's build this, and I'll show you why. So it actually adds stuff to this markdown file, and it will read this by default. Okay, but you could edit it in YAML, with a YAML editor, and then just do extension MD. Or would that work? Ah, so you could edit, edit it in a YAML editor and add an MD, so you can't, and it's because I skipped a part right at the beginning of this. Thank you. So, you notice I have this, in, it's, this is in a markdown file. I have some markdown notation here. I have this in a YAML block. Thank you, I forgot to mention that. Um, and so that's why um, this, is, uh, this, is, this is done this way. And so I, and that's why it's, even though it's in a markdown file, I still have YAML formatting uh, in VS Code because it's smart enough to know that I'm in a YAML block. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Okay, so to actually build this, any other questions before we build it? Uh, oh, that's just me getting ready. Okay, so we're gonna go down into, so we're, all we're gonna do is run autorest readme.markdown. And so it's gonna read that file uh, for all of the parameters to autorest. There you go, and it did actually work. It took a second, but. Um, okay, so when autorest runs, uh, this uh, swagger doc is pretty small. So I think it's like 700 lines. The, the original one for uh, runway is like 9,000. Uh, so it can take a lot longer than this. Like this is actually gonna go a lot faster. As an example, I tried to build the, um, the graph module, it took 40 minutes. But that's because they have a lot of directives and I'll get into the directives and why that can take extra time. Uh, so I'm not gonna go over some of, these, some of these warnings because I haven't taken the time to figure out what they mean. The module works, so oh well. <laughs> We get this nice generation complete down at the end. And so what this ends up with is we now have all these extra folders uh, inside of our source file, our, sor our source folder. And some of these are important, some of them aren't. We're not gonna cover everything, we don't have the time. Uh, but this docs folder, for example, oh, let's, we gotta build the module first and then that'll get populated. Uh, so the generated folder, this is where all of the C-sharp code ends up. So we have all of our commandlets in here. So we have get rw connection, for example. So you ever wonder what a commandlet looks like in C Sharp? Here's an example. Uh, and then we also have all of the models. So all of the, those uh, definitions we looked at, these, these, are, these are all represented here in classes in, uh, in C Sharp. And it has all the, the hierarchy in here as well. So if you, so if you it, it can learn that by reading it from the Swagger doc, it's really cool. Uh, for people that like C-sharp. Uh, so, but what we'll do to turn this into a module is we're gonna use the build module uh, script. This is a PowerShell script, it's great. It's gonna do all the compiling for you, it's gonna build the module and let you run it. So let's do that. So I'm just gonna run, it's in the same directory, so I'm gonna run, oh, before we do that, let's take a look at that readme. It's gonna be a little different now. So the readme, uh, it gets added with all this extra information. Uh, and so you notice you have the, the region generated tags and region tags at the bottom. So that part is what's gonna be generated. And what's really cool is it adds like the status, the status badge. Uh, so when you're in uh, GitHub and you have built an Autorest module and published it, this will display the version as a little icon in your readme, so it's really cool. Uh, but it also tells you that it's an Autorest module and it gives you some links to the documentation uh, and then at the bottom it adds in, so this is where our settings are. So that's how the readme works. 
all right, so we got build, auto complete, and dash run. So dash run, uh, actually, let's just do build. And then we can actually look at what it does. All right, so build. Uh, and if you're working in VS Code, I highly recommend running the build and the run module in a dedicated uh, PowerShell window. Because this, this can choke if you do it multiple times inside of VS Code. So there you go. So it, it runs through, it does all the building, the compiling. Uh, there is some formats built into AutoRest, which, which is pretty cool. Uh, and then the basic tests for it, and then of course it'll tell you that to run it, run the run module. And then inside the code, we now end up with our, um, all of our docs. So, uh, and I'm gonna tell you right now that writing docs is important, but can anyone guess how much of the docs I've written for our module? Yeah, it's, it doesn't feel very productive, and I just need to do it, so. Uh, but, but it gets familiar with Platy PS, same kind of deal with, with markdown files. Uh, and we'll get into the customs, adding, adding modules in just a minute, so let's just run this sucker. Run module. There we go, so now we got our module. If you run into errors here, well, I did a lot of them, so if you want some help, just let me know, so. They aren't all documented, is what I'm trying to say. So if we do a git command, module runway, and this looks kind of funny because the, sorry, the, the prompt there, so on. So there's all, all of our commandments. Uh, and so, and I can tell you just from having, you know, looked at the swagger and seen this output before, that, you know, git rw connection, that should be pretty obvious. This is actually comes from the, the listing of the rw connection, so it's the one that's gonna return all of them, but import, RW connection, does anyone know what that does? That the import verb is just kind of a weird one. Let me, let me show you why, um, why, that's, why that's something I wanna point out. So in the Swagger doc, and this is something that I banged my head up against for a long time. So we have git RW connection, and we have this operation ID of connection load. And so in autorest.powershell, it maps that load to import. And that was really confusing to me. It took me forever to figure that out, so I'm very proud to tell you guys that if you have problems, it's because of the operation ID, okay? Uh, and if we look in, so this is in the, um, the autorest.powershell um, repository, uh, and I've got this link in, in, in the, one, one of the readme's. So in the PowerShell internal name infer, .ts, so this is TypeScript. Don't have to know TypeScript to be able to read this, by the way. Um, I'm just gonna do a quick search. Let's search for load. Bam, look. It maps the load word inside of an operation ID to import, okay? So that's why it's confusing because the developers chose load. So we'll get into how to fix that. And I'm saying that, but it'll be like just a few minutes till we get there. Yes, yes, so what we're looking at is. Well, so in, in the, so is load and import synonymous? So what I'm, what I'm getting at here is that the load verb inside of the operation ID, um, Autorest PowerShell looks at that and it says, well, what verb should this be? And so this is the mapping of finding load means it's gonna be the import RW connection. So it's gonna map it to the PowerShell verb import. Does that make sense? Yeah, but, yeah, but the, the functionality, I guess, if you're, so I'm not sure I'm to look at the, a, a rest method, if the rest verb is called get, right? Mm -hmm. Then the get uh, will get you an object. Yeah. Yeah, so, so the question here is list versus load? Or, yeah, list versus get versus load. Okay, okay, so let me, let me, let me, let me go through that because I spent a lot of time on this one, so I'm glad you're asking questions. So, in uh, this connections uh, path, this is where in our API we have the, the, the list, like you're saying. And this is what translates into uh, get RW connection. So we look at help get Bingo, I forgot to say that. Did I not say that? The developers are the ones that's called this list, not me. And so the, and so the Swagger doc ends up having, saying list, and then, and then Autorest converts list to 
get. And then if we look at help for import RW connection, and you notice there's no parameters here. I mean, besides like, you know, the default. So these, the rest of these are all default built into um, the HTTP client in Autorest. So if you look at help for import um, RW connection, this is where you can see that one of the parameters is connection ID. So we know that this one is actually uh, this uh, connection ID get, this guy right here. And I'm saying it's confusing because they chose to call it operator connection load. And so Autorest says, well, load must be import in PowerShell. And so it's confusing to me. I agree. It is confusing that they chose to use load there instead of get. Yeah. 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 Yeah, yeah, it is confusing. That's why, that's why I wanted to touch on that. Uh, and so uh, when we get into directives, I'll show you how you can change this without changing the swagger. You want to do as little to the swagger as possible. And at the end, I got a little graphic on how that process works. So let's, let's add some authentication. Or any other questions before we jump into customizing here? Okay. So we're gonna exit out of there. We're gonna go do. See anywhere in 04? Okay, so to add authentication, this is where it can get really confusing because every API is gonna be different. So I can't sit here and tell you how to do it for an API that you might be working with. Uh, and however, in the API that uh, at runway is uh, we have the uh, invoke RW login authentication, which gets a session token. So you pass it your email password and it sends you back a token. And, and the problem with Autorest is Autorest doesn't know what to do with that token or even that it's important. And so we have to, we have to, we have to tell it that it's important. So I'm not a big fan of C Sharp, um, but I'm told every year I come to these things that I should be. Uh, so this is, uh, this, oh, let me give some context here. So in the custom folder, so if we look at the previous example, um, it adds this custom folder. Uh, this is where we put additional commandlets or and the commands can be C sharp, can be PowerShell, doesn't matter. And so if we pre-populate this custom folder, which I'm doing here, um, I'm adding in a, an extension to, you can see the module class and the custom init method. I'm not gonna go into a lot of details in this because I'm gonna be honest with you guys, this is a copy and paste and edit a little bit from uh, the Autorest PowerShell example. Um, so inside of this, this method, what we're gonna do is I'm adding in uh, I'm just appending to the pipeline here, and I have this function called add session token. This is where the magic happens. So down here, I'm just saying on line 33, if the request already has an auth header, go ahead and remove it. And then I'm adding in a new authorization header uh, that is gonna be session space, and then this environmental variable. So that's how I'm cheating. I'm just putting an environmental variable, and then every time a command that runs, it will add that to the authorization header. So all we have to do now is authenticate, add that token to uh, the auth, or sorry, add that token to the environmental variable, and then Autorest will pick it up and uh, be happy. So let's run through and do this really quick. All right, so I'm already in the directory. We're gonna read me, down, mark down. Cool, and this runs same thing as before. Uh, nice and fast, there we go, generation complete. Uh, and since we already added the custom stuff in here, we're now just gonna do a build. I'm just gonna get right into build dash run. Fingers crossed we don't get any errors. There we go, okay, cool. So now, if you look at, well actually we're not gonna see anything different, so we can, do, we can still do git command. We still see, we still have the same commands, uh, but now, if we run invoke, RW login authentication. We're gonna pass it an email address and password. Um, however, in practicing this morning, I realized that it takes a plain text, string, ugh, plain text string. So if I sit here and type it, I'm gonna give you guys my password. So let's jump right into the next example where we use a secure string and actually extend the authentication uh, to make it a little more um, transparent. So to authenticate with that example, we have to do two steps. I've got them here. 
Uh, we, have to we have to create the session by calling the authentication endpoint to get our session token. And then we're assigning that token to the environment variable runway session token. And then because we have that extra C-sharp code, all future commands will then add that to the header. Does that make sense? Cool. I know this is the confusing part, and I know that because it was really confusing to me. This, you know, this is not something that's easy to just figure out because it's different. They give you examples, and the examples aren't like your API. So. Okay, so. Adding commandlets, the first command that I want to look at, um, and so, I, so I'm now in just a, cl a clean, clean folder here. I've got that same module.cs from before, so it adds the auth tokens down at the bottom. But what I've done, and this should look, this should look really familiar to everybody. This is just a PowerShell function. Like there's no, nothing special about this, and yet this is an extension of my Autorest module. Like this is what I love about this. I can write just plain old PowerShell, and it's, and it's another function that's going to get added. Uh, so in this case, this takes two parameters. They are email and password. And you notice password is now a secure string, so I can now show you guys how the authentication works. But the cool part is now at line 13 to 14, my authentication has now become transparent. So if someone runs connect-runway, now their token gets stashed in an environmental variable where all the commandlets can now access it. Yes? So you, you could, yeah, that'd be great. Okay. That'd be really smart. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah. Hey, show me up. Maybe you should be up here. <laughs> that's that's a really good idea. Okay, so I mean, the only problem is you still have to. You, I haven't, I haven't figured out if there's a way to work around putting the password in plain text to pass to the actual off. off. I don't know. I don't know how to deal with secure strings in C sharp. So. That's as far as my, secure, as my secure strings go. I still pass it as a plain text to the, the invoke one. Well, I'd have to figure out how to get the C sharp commandlet to accept a PS credential. That's the part that I, I don't know how to do. So, so yes, using a PS credential would be a good way to do it. Who is it? Okay. Uh, uh, I am not familiar with using MSAL, so no. Oh, so you're, are, are you asking like what happens with invoke RW login authentication? Oh, you're saying what is the API doing in the background for that? Oh, okay. So what security provider am I authenticating against in the API? Okay, uh, so that is a better question for our developers. <laughs> so our API, the back end is, it's all, it's all um, a, I, don't know, I don't know, I don't wanna say a custom back end. They, I mean, they're using libraries to do it all. So they might be using the MSAL library. Oh, I'm just thinking like, that MSAL.ps Oh, I have not heard of MSAL.ps. So that sounds like it would work great with something like Microsoft services, where they have all that built into the service. Isn't it, for example, the, the partial graph SDK uses that? Yeah. And, and, so it's a good time to look at uh, MSAL.ps. So uh, right now, the Runway API, we only have one flow, and that's user credentials. So, but yeah, great point. MSAL.ps is, is what, um, what was brought up here. Uh, so any other questions? I do have another commandlet here, and this is pretty specific to our API. I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on it. Um, but in our API, we can get, if we wanna get a, all of the connections, you do the get RW connection, and it calls the list operation ID. If you wanna get one, you have to get it by ID. Um, but if you wanna get them by name, you have to build a query. And so I wrote a script that does a query. Uh, and the reason I did this in a script is because INET can never remember how to build that query. So the command that does it for me, and at the end, calls the query endpoint. 
So you can build quality of life commandlets in PowerShell in Autorest. And we'll take a look at that. So let's go ahead and build this. Yeah, so all the custom stuff, we just got the module.cs and then the two extra commandlets. So we're going to build it, and, or sorry, run autorest and then run build-run. And now we can actually talk to the API. Now we got all the other stuff figured out. Cool. We're going to do connect-runway, email. And then I can type in my password and nobody gets to know what it is. Sweet. And in the background, it's, it's cached that session token. I'm not going to show it to you guys, um, you know, for security reasons. But now we can do get rw connection, whoops, without the one end. And now we can start actually getting objects back from the API. And we can even do the, uh, actually, let's, here. What's really cool is since everything is typed, we can now, I can type an i and tap, do tab auto completion because that command that has an output type. And so we can actually see some of the items, these connection items. Uh, and let's see, let's grab, well, let's, actually let's just do the zero dot ID. And we now get, get RV connection, connection ID. Oh, it's, sorry, we haven't fixed that yet. It's import RW connection because it's really confusing still. All right. Now we can see if we can get one right with that call. So, oh shoot, three minutes. So let's get, let's, let's, let's talk about directives here. Directives are my favorite part. Any, any questions about this so far? Okay, cool. So directives, and I apologize that we're speeding through this. Uh, we had some really good questions, so it's totally worth it. I'm not gonna complain. Okay, so, so I mentioned that we have that, that import command that doesn't make any sense, but it, autorest.powershell thinks it does because it's a load, right? And the developers are the ones that pick the load. So, in autorest, they have this idea of what it's called Directives. So this is where I have the link to the name infer. So it's that's it's the, there. So my import commandlet doesn't make any sense. It should be a get, right? So I'm saying in this case, line 32, where so this is looking at commandlets. So this is this idea in directives of context. The context here is a commandlet, and it, it, that is implicit because I'm using the verb uh, uh, parameter. There. So where the verb is import, just set the verb to be get. That makes sense. So now my import RW connection is going to be get RW connection. And then also, let me show you this one. Did I already exit out of it? I did. I'll show you this one in a second. So one of the, one of the commandlets um, uh, is like invoke RW count connection. Can anyone guess what that means? Like it, it's confusing. Um, but what all it does is it returns the number of, or it returns the count of connection objects that you have in your tenant. And so here, line 40, I'm saying where the, or sorry, 39, where the verb is invoke, 40, uh, where the subject is count and then something. That's a regular, regular expression. I now want it to be get rw connection count. So instead of invoke uh, rw count connection, it'll be now get rw connection count. So it now is, should be, more, it should be able to figure out what it does. And this last one is a little complex. I'm sorry, I don't have time to explain it. But you can do uh, regex replace with, um, uh, with directives. And in this case, this allows me to configure the URL. I'm sorry I wanted to show this. If you guys want to follow up with me afterwards, I'm happy to get into exactly what this does. But this allows us to customize what the URL is, because even though it's hard-coded uh, in the, um, the Swagger doc. So quickly, let's, uh, let's take a look here. And so the way that Autorest handles directives is it builds everything, and then if there are directives, it runs through and does the directives. So after you add directives, if you have a large Swagger doc, it's gonna slow it down. But it's not a bad thing, because it's still all automated. So there's no manual labor involved. So we're gonna go ahead and run this. Oh, I just got the, my phone just vibrated, it says it's time's up. And now if we do git command module runway, now you can see we now have get RW connection. And you guys all might be wondering, wasn't there already a get RW connection? Because there was, right? So what happens to that? Uh, if we do a help 
get RW connection, and this is really cool, I love this about Autorest. It's just, it's smart enough to just make it an additional parameter set. So it's possible for you to write a custom get RW connection, and Autorest is smart enough to make it a, an additional parameter set. That is really freaking awesome, in my opinion. Yeah. And, and, but now, since we can uh, customize uh, the, the authentication, sorry, the domain, the host, uh, I now also added uh, a runway domain. So it's just, it's just, I'm cheating again, using an environmental variable. So now there's a runway domain environmental variable that it sets in this command so that it can, so the, the original use case was to be able to talk to our staging environment with the SDK. Uh, but long term, we'll be setting up like a self-hosted version of Runway. So we want to, I want customers to be able to talk to their own Runway instead of ours. Uh, do you guys want to, you guys good for one more slide? It's a good one, I promise. Oops. Uh, oh, dang it. There we go. Uh, so this is the rough, uh, rough process that I use. There are some manual edits, didn't have time to get into them, I'm sorry, if you wanna talk about some of the edits that we do, I'm happy to follow up. You call on Autorest README, that's basically what it does. Uh, and then at the end, sorry, and then this is where you would add customizations because it builds a custom folder, add some links in there if you need some help. Uh, and then you're running build module, which will build module, and then there's a pack module. So it'll actually pack it and do get packet, package for you so you can publish it to the runway, or sorry, to PowerShell Gallery. Sorry we had to speed up at the end, but thanks, thanks, stand by.